Hey guys, it's Sad Crow Man. Uh, somebody told me that I make too many Melanie Martinez videos. So naturally, today I will be doing a five-part retrospect on K through 12, the issues Melanie faced during producing the film, the criticism, and why it's actually a great and criminally underrated movie. Not a single soul asked me to do this. In the background, I'm doodling my OCs in K through 12 costumes because I I just needed a break from my book release. So anyway, uh, if you're watching this video, I assume you've already seen K through 12. If not, I'll be recapping the film, but I encourage you to go ahead and give it a watch. It's free here on YouTube. It's also for sale here on YouTube if you're a sucker. So <laughs> go ahead and watch it. I'll still be here when you're done. <laughs> Part zero: A recap of K through 12. K through 12 is a pop surrealism film about the titular character Crybaby and growing cast of magical friends taking down an oppressive sleepaway school simply called K through 12. Students at K through 12 are forced to follow a strict purity culture. Disobedient students are forcibly doped up on bright pink happy pills to keep them in line. Resistant students may find themselves strapped to their desks in detention. Other than that, the oppressive systems that they have to face often reflect real-life issues. Some of these issues are, you know, typical things in the American education system, such as boys and girls being held to different standards, tampons being unreasonably difficult to obtain despite the fact that they're a necessity, uh, discipline being valued more than education, and sex education keeping teens naive and in the dark, which makes it easier for our teachers to use their positions to prey on vulnerable students. However, the film also uses school as a stage to portray larger social issues uh, within America, such as peaceful protesting being met with disproportionate punitive action, trans people not being able to serve America as their authentic selves in the military, women's voices not being valued in politics unless they play the game like a man does and pander to the men in power, what they want, you know, you, you, know, you get the drill. In the film, the students kill the principal, but it's a hollow victory as he is immediately replaced by his son, Leo. Realizing it is not enough to simply take out the person in power, they instead make plans to dismantle the whole system. Leo, vengeful after the death of his father, tries to prevent this from happening by locking all the students in the school, but in the end, Crybaby traps Leo in the closet, evacuates the students, and poofs the school off into oblivion. Part 1 picking up where the Crybaby era left off. The Crybaby era was a tremendous success for Melanie, who gained a cult following after competing on The Voice. Despite not having any radio hits, their debut LP sold 41,000 units on the first week, debuted at the top of the Alternative Albums chart, charted on Billboard for two unbroken years without falling off, and was certified platinum on February 24th, 2017. Later that year, on August 15th, Melanie Martinez revealed in a review with Billboard that their sophomore studio album was finished, but that rather than releasing individual music videos like they had previously, there would be a film instead. So this wasn't too much of a sock. A sock? A shock for big fans of Melanie, as they had made music videos for every single song off the standard edition of Crybaby, and those videos all followed a storyline, though the video for Mad Hatter wouldn't be released until one month later on September 23rd, 2017. The Crybaby album also came packaged with a storybook-style pamphlet chronicling the life and the traumas of the titular character, so obviously Crybaby's story was not over yet and there was still more to be told, so fans were stoked for this movie release. In an Instagram story, Melanie revealed that they wrote the script from the summer of 2016 to February 2017, but that they had to cut down their script to fit the budget. So during this time, on December 2017, a former <sighs> friend of Melanie falsely accused them of some demonetizable things, you know, leading to a slew of drama, and I, I think we all know what I'm talking about here, so I'm sure that was part of the reason for these delays. And speaking from personal experience, yes, um, art does come from pain, but editing, it, it, it's just straight up painful on its own, let alone when you're killing your darlings not to make the script better, but because you don't have the budget to make the project you wanted. Like, I would die. So considering all that was going on right now, I'm sure this was a really stressful time for Melanie, but they did manage to finish the script for the film anyway and handed it in mid-2018, an exact date's not given. Following Melanie handing in this cut-down script, a uh, production of the film actually moved relatively fast. A lot faster than I would have expected, considering all the people on Twitter complaining about how long it was taking, but... 
Anyway, casting was done summarily afterward by London-based company E.T. Casting, who put out a casting call for a film codenamed Soup and Salad. That fall, Melanie explored Europe in search of film locations. They decided to film on location in Budapest, Hungary in late 2018. It was cold in Budapest that time of year, and many of the actors wore coats over their costumes while rehearsing. Filming took place relatively quickly, though, over 31 days, and Melanie co-directed with Alyssa... God, please help me pronounce this. Please help me pronounce this. Torvanen? Uh, Josh McKee and Mark Kelly. Editing took place in early 2019, and Melanie themselves assisted with the process. In fact, uh, in an Instagram story, Mel actually stated that post-production was their favorite part of filmmaking. I would think that would be a nightmare, but... <laughs> hey, somebody's gotta do it. Not long after, the promotion for the film began, with a 19-second teaser trailer being released on May 15th, 2019. Two more teasers would be released that May on a weekly basis. The third teaser trailer finally revealed the film's release date, whispering September 6th surprisingly ominously, actually. K-12 through was only shown in theaters for one day, September 5th, and the film was given an R rating, which surprised me. I could have sworn it was PG-13, seeing as how the blood looks like hot pink paint, but uh, f*** ah. my memory, I guess. And speaking of f*** ah. that's probably the word that earned it an R rating. I thought it didn't count in songs. What? I don't know why I thought that. It doesn't matter. <laughs> The rating didn't keep them from grossing in $359,377 in the box office that night, which ranks it as the sixth highest gross- I can, I can say this. The sixth highest grossing opening night for a film domestically. The following day, K-12 was released alongside the album. You could buy it packaged along with the album either as a digital download or on DVD, but you, I don't think you could buy it on its own, so sales of the album were likely the priority. During this time, it was temporarily free on YouTube and made it to number two on trending. The film would later be reverted back to free when some of the hype died down, though it still made money off of ad revenue. Given that it was only in theaters for one day and that it was packaged for sale alongside the album, it's hard to say exactly how much money the film made and if it made back its budget of, like, Five six million. Uh, however, given that the album debuted at number three with fifty seven thousand sales, and considering the two were packaged together, it's safe to say a number of those album sales included movie sales. And again, uh, it hit number two on YouTube trending, so not a bad opening week for a low budget film. And also, of course, it's been earning ad revenue on YouTube for the past three years now, and it has over a hundred million views. I maybe even a uh, over a hundred eleven, I think, by now. The K-12 through uniform was also sold to fans as merch, and of course there's the other merch. And then, of course, you know, the very existence of the film assists the album sales, and as of today, K-12 through has over 500,000 certified sales in the U.S., which certifies it as gold. So, you know, to those who are asking, did K-12 through earn back those $6 million? I'd say, all things considered, between shows, merch, album sales, etc., etc., yeah, it almost certainly has by now. Or, you know, if you want a simpler metric to judge by, obviously, yes, it made its money back or else they wouldn't be making a second movie. Welcome to capitalism. And speaking of capitalism, before we go to part two, this video is sponsored by no one, no one, I'm just kidding. But I do have two side channels, one for storytelling and one for witchcraft. And viewers like you can get them monetized just by watching them. I'd appreciate it a lot if you have time. The spiritual channel is a work in progress, but the storytelling channel has a lot of content. Okay, it's mostly just me playing The Sims with my OCs until the audiobook is ready, but whatever. I guess there's now a canon AU where Eredi breaks up the lead couples from The Notebook and Twilight to ruin their happy endings. <laughs> Next week I'm doing The Hunger Games. <laughs> So you can watch that if you- uh, oh, you'd rather watch the video you clicked on. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Let's get back to the video. Part 2. Little Budget Big Heart K-12, through the album, got widespread critical acclaim and it was an undeniable success, although the reception of the K-12 through film is somewhat divisive. Uh, most people are on the same page with the film's shortcomings, but not everyone agrees that those shortcomings dampen their enjoyment of the film. It's critically acclaimed in most circles, but it's dismissed as a disjointed string of music videos and others. For the most part, though, it's reviewed favorably, both by fans and critics. However, it's it's really been mostly overlooked by film critics. 
It's not really taken seriously as a movie, so reviews are few and far between. Rotten Tomatoes didn't even bother touching it, which is fine because I don't bother touching Rotten Tomatoes. Now, I cannot stress this enough as we proceed. Making a movie is not an easy task. There are so many logistics involved in making a film like K-12 through that it's not even an option for most people, except for the very determined, or let's be honest here, the very rich. Every little detail you see in a film, somebody had to make that happen, and somebody had to shell out the cash for it. I've written some screenplays myself, but as far as turning those into a movie goes, I would get overwhelmed just thinking about all the work I'd have to do. So this isn't something I would uh, weigh into a film critique, but since this is a retrospect, it is worth mentioning that K-12 through is Melanie's first film. Like, ever. And I guarantee this was a learning experience. If this was Melanie's tenth film, whether a review or a retrospect, I'd probably be more critical but, you know, even with the help of co-directors Alyssa Tor- Tor- Torvenin, Mark Kelly, and Josh McKee, there's still a lot of work to do and a lot of things that just don't go according to plan. Now, that's not to say that this film doesn't have issues. I'm not going to pretend that it's absolutely perfect, but it is worth noting that most people don't realize that this is a low-budget film. It doesn't look like one, mostly because, you know, the aesthetic is top tier, <laughs> but it is. Atlantic Record didn't exactly provide a generous budget. Of the budget issues, Melanie stated, quote, At first they were like, we can do two million, but as I was cutting down the scenes, I realized there was only so much I could cut before compromising my vision and the story, end quote. The final budget has been estimated at like five or six million dollars, some of which I'm pretty sure came out of Melanie's own pocket. Now, six million sounds like a lot, but it's really more of the budget you'd expect for, say, 13 music videos with brief transitional scenes in between them. You know, it's not really a feature film, much less a feature film with CGI. I mean, it's not impossible. No, it's not possible, but it's hard. For comparison purposes, Kill Bill, which famously had almost no CGI, cost $30 million to produce. And Kill Bill, I'm using that as an example because it's about the length that Melanie wanted, if I recall. I don't know, I could be lying to you right now. But even Juno, uh, which is considered a low-budget film, cost 6.5 to $7 million to produce, and that was in mid-2000s money for both, by the way. Early to mid-2000s money. And I'm sure everyone is well aware that the economy has tanked since then. And the reason I'm using Juno as a comparison here is because A, similar setting, high school, but it's also a useful contrast because Juno, it didn't need CGI. It was filmed in an ordinary high school and not in a Hungarian palace, and the costuming, it was just everyday clothes, and very little was cut from the original script. K-12 through did not benefit from any of those budget conveniences, hence why Melanie had such a hard time maintaining this vision. One surefire way to make a film cheaper is, after all, to make it shorter, which is unfortunate for me. I'd love it if K-12 through was longer than Titanic, <laughs> which I believe had the biggest movie budget of all time. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it did. It, it might have been dethroned by now, but that was an expensive movie. So yeah, that was not happening. <laughs> Now, there are a lot of factors that can affect a film's budget, and K-12 through has saved a lot of money, I'm sure, by not having any A-list actors, having the soundtrack already in their lap, and having Melanie Martinez do a large bulk of the work themselves. For example, by writing the script of the film themselves, Melanie probably saved anywhere between $20,000 and $100,000. Melanie also took part in the direction, costume design, styling, makeup, and editing of the film, etc., etc., probably more things that I'm not even thinking of right now, but however, you know, the budget was not high enough for them to do everything they wanted. For example, uh, the reason for the school disappearing in a puff of smoke instead of burning it down like they had originally planned was because they couldn't afford the CGI it would take to burn down a Hungarian palace, and doing it for real was probably off the table. Additionally, other characters like Miss Harper were supposed to get more satisfying endings, and the original script was much longer. Unfortunately, with a budget smaller than that of Juno's accounting for inflation, some sacrifices did have to be made. So this film, which was supposed to be like three hours long, was cut down to 92 minutes. So subtracting the album's playtime of 46 minutes, and then four more minutes for Fire Drill, 
That left Melanie with only a half hour <laughs> to tell this incredibly ambitious story. Can you imagine cutting like two hours worth of script down to 30 minutes? Even for a professional screenwriter, that would be absolute hell, especially given the time constraints and circumstances. And again, that winter is when they were falsely accused of, I'm not going to say it, so please don't demonetize me. And if it was supposed to be three hours long, we're talking probably about 150 to 200 pages of script to cut through. Uh, and all the while, while that's going on, your fans, aka your customer base, are distancing themselves from you or yelling at you, hashtag canceling you, whatever, for something you literally could have possibly done because you were on the other side of the country at the time. Yes, I'm the guy who made that very long video about it. <laughs> and then, because of how fast the music industry works, Melanie only had a couple of months to butcher their work into the small fraction of what it used to be. When ideally, with a project like that, you would let it sit for a while so you can come back to it with fresh eyes and determine what is and isn't necessary. And you know, meanwhile, even after the false allegations were cleared up thoroughly, Mel was still bombarded with messages from fans screaming, Where is the album? Where is the album? We know it's finished. Why don't you just release it? What's taking so long? You know, meanwhile, Melanie and their crew took less than a year to rehearse lines, record, etc. I believe filming, yeah, it only took 31 days, so incidentally, that's the same amount of time as Juno. And all the while, fans were whining about how long it was taking, when things were actually going at a pretty swift speed, you know, considering all the crap Melanie was dealing with at the time, I, I, it's, I just don't get that sort of behavior. Like, there's not a doubt in my mind that this was not easy to deal with, and the more I think about it, the more I understand and appreciate the song and sequence for show and tell. But I digress. Though, if I may just take a minute to say, cue the sad violin music, uh, it's sad that some people can't just wait patiently for a couple of years for Melanie's next release, and will actually stoop as low as to harass Melanie just because they don't drop a release every year. Like, to put the ridiculousness of this into perspective, my favorite band is Nirvana. How long do you think I have been waiting for a new Nirvana album? Yeah. I don't want to get too real here, this is more of a video essay topic, but maybe, maybe consider being a little more grateful for your favorite artists because they'll all be gone someday, and we as an audience are not entitled to a never-ending stream of art, so please treat artists better while they're here, or else you might regret it when they aren't. Just a PSA there. But anyway, moving on. There's been a lot of speculation to where the budget went, and one of the leading theories is the filming locations. Which, of course, that's a natural culprit to jump to because they filmed on location in Budapest, Hungary. So, naturally, there are going to be travel costs to get everyone there. The, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, the Esther Hazy Palace <laughs> served as the facade for the school behind the CGI. And they also filmed the dance hall, the gardens, the cake room, and the corridors within the palace. The rest of the film was filmed elsewhere in Budapest. According to the wiki, other filming locations included the Metropolitan Irvine Sabo Library, the Danube Palace, the Gellert Spawn Bath, the Rede Castle. <laughs> Taz de Palota Exchange Palace and the... <laughs> I hope there are no Hungarians in the audience right now. The Podmanitsky Vigiaso Rende Veni Castelli Mansion. Listen, if you're a Hungarian and you're here watching this, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's easy to see why Melanie was drawn to Budapest. The architecture of Hungary is perfect. It made for an absolutely beautiful film. Every single frame of the film is strikingly beautiful, and while CGI did play a big role in making K-12 K-12, it wouldn't have been the same if it were filmed on some set in Hollywood. And it's important to note that, while this couldn't have been a cheap decision, it may not have taken up as much of the budget as people speculate it did. If you're an American, palaces probably sound rare and expensive, but Hungary is a small country with a low cost of living, and there are like, <coughs> excuse me, hiccup, 2,000 palaces and mansions there, so it's not the equivalent to, say, filming in the Buckingham Palace or something. And while I doubt it was cheap, the impact on the budget was probably nominal compared to the visuals that it brought to the table. 
Otherwise, I don't think she would have made this decision considering how important this story is to her. If I had to pick one culprit for the cost of the film, I would absolutely blame the CGI first and foremost. It's well known that CGI is extremely expensive, with some films dropping hundreds of billions of dollars on CGI alone. Uh, depending on what you're doing, like a single shot can actually cost you $100,000. <laughs> I would be shook if CGI wasn't at least half of the budget. However, I challenge you to make convincing special effects in a film about students with magical powers without it coming off as too cheesy. Though personally, I'd have found it charming if they went the way of Quentin Tarantino. Um, you know, modern audiences do have high expectations. Uh, especially, you know, this generation having grown up with CGI, they're more accustomed to it. So with a large portion of Melanie's audience being young still, I'm... Though I am sure there are a lot of teens who appreciate the charm of retro things, they aren't generally invested uh, the same way my generation was. Just like my generation tends to snub black and white films and, God forbid, silent films. So if you didn't grow up watching shows with, say, puppets and FX machines and you're accustomed to the realism that CGI brings to the table, it, yeah, it can be harder to take older shows seriously. But at the same time, the more realism there is, the easier it is to immerse the audience in your world. So as costly as CGI is, I would argue that it was a necessary evil. There's really no point in pointing fingers at Melanie for not budgeting the film well enough. It was already a low-budget film to begin with. I'm confident that cutting corners with the filming location and the CGI in favor of keeping in more of the script wouldn't have made the film better, just a little longer. They did the best they could with what they had, and I do admire that. Though obviously I'm still hoping they got a bigger budget for the second film. <laughs> Part 3. Other Film Criticisms So budget-derived issues aside, a common criticism of K-12 is the acting, uh, particularly Melanie's acting, since Melanie's name is on the cover and it'll, you know. Now, the amount of time an actor has to rehearse their lines varies, but I admit, uh, based on the fast timetable of production and the end product, I'd like to say they could have taken more time to rehearse, even if it meant pushing back the release date and making everybody scream. <laughs> of course, this may be an extension of the budget issue, because actors are paid for everything they do, and that does include rehearsals. It's hard to say, but yeah, still, people are especially hard on Melanie for their acting because, again, it's their name on the cover. And I think some people forget that this is their debut. I mean, yeah, Melanie's acted in music videos, but a film, acting in a film, that's a different game entirely. It's the sort of thing that takes practice. I don't understand why anyone would expect an effortless transition from music videos to a whole act movie. I mean, well, unless they just don't know how much effort goes into movies, but, you know... Melanie was responsible for a lot of things. They wrote the script, directed, did the costume design, etc., etc. So they were really busy. Though memorizing their lines probably wasn't much of a challenge given that, you know, they wrote them. But they still had to learn the choreography for 13 music videos. Considering the time window this was produced in, I'm not all that miffed she didn't nail all her dialogue perfectly for her debut. You know, acting is an art and it could take years to perfect, and this was an extreme extremely ambitious project already. So if you're comparing Melanie's acting to veterans like Natalie Portman or Kate Winslet, I'm sure there's something to be desired, but, you know, for her first foray into the acting world, her dialogue delivery wasn't unbearable. And I'm sure that Melanie will improve over time. This is her first time in her career delivering speaking lines like this, after all. Uh, the Crybaby era didn't have any lines spoken by Crybaby that I can recall, and the story was instead conveyed non-verbally. So I forgive Melanie for coming across un unnatural when delivering some of the lines, and I'm sure they'll improve with time. Also, please excuse me for going back and forth between she and they pronouns all the time instead of just picking one. <laughs> I know it's awkward, but sometimes the plural nature of they and them makes it confusing in some sentences and I flip-flop a little. I'm sorry. But anyway, frankly, I think some of what people considered bad acting in K-12 wasn't necessarily bad, but intentionally cartoonish and unnerving. The acting in K-12 oftentimes reaches something called the uncanny valley. You're watching humans... You recognize the emotion they're portraying, yet there's something subtly off about the way they're acting, so it registers as creepy. 
I'm pretty sure it's intentional. Take, for instance, the scene where Crybaby is at the lunch table being recruited by students in identical wigs and mannerisms, or the scene where the students in show and tell are eagerly pounding on their desks in the exact same way. Or any scene with that blue guy. Again, the film is surrealist horror, so I'd argue that uh, the side characters are more cartoonish than they are human at times. And that bothers some people, particularly those who prefer realism, but good acting is pretty subjective and depends on the film. Personally, I and a lot of others thought the cartoonish behavior of these characters worked with Melanie's creepy cute stylistic choices throughout the film. And if you're a critic, you're probably thinking, okay, but that doesn't explain the leads, some of whom came off as unnatural, and I do agree with that. So what went wrong there? Unfortunately, the best and biggest actors tend to cost a lot of money, and, you know, we already went over the budget, and you have to pay actors for everything they do for you, including those rehearsals. The production cost can stack up exponentially if you insist on hiring top talent. Melanie did mention that keeping K-12 through diverse was difficult when casting, which made sense because they were filming in Hungary, and probably had to pay the room and board for all the actors they flew in that were not local. And as I've explained in length, the budget was tight. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, flying an A-list actor to Hungary for an entire month? The accommodations they would expect? Oh my god. <laughs> that would probably be the entire six million right there. <laughs> now, some of you may be thinking, okay, but didn't Juno, which you mentioned earlier, uh, get Jennifer Garner, who was an A-lister at the time, on their budget of $6 million. And Yeah, miracles happen sometimes. Miss Garner did do Juno for a nominal salary, and in exchange, though, uh, she got a percentage of the movie's back-end gross. And if it wasn't for that, Juno would have been a much more expensive movie, because they were basically offering Jennifer Garner money that hadn't been made yet. <laughs> So yeah, the acting in K-12 through may not have been perfect, and some actors were better than others. Um, Maggie, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, but Zina's performance as Kelly blows me away every time, for example. I could not imagine anyone else as Kelly. But I'm not gonna call out the actors who I personally didn't think do a good job, and I don't think the acting is as bad as some people make it out to be. I've seen worse movies with bigger budgets. I'd actually say Melanie did a great job, you know, especially in the music video segments where they were in their element, you know, and again, as for being able to deliver speaking lines naturally, that's something Melanie will improve with in time. Though Melanie seems to be one of those people who prefer to be behind the camera rather than in front of it. I mean, this is the same Melanie who's been known to toke a demonetizable substance to tolerate being on stage performing in front of people. It's also possible that Melanie is simply more passionate about creating and directing than uh, she is for acting, and that's all there is to it. Either way, I mean, it's, it's not like Melanie has an identical twin who loves acting, for so for continuity's sake, they're the only one who can play Crybaby whether they like it or not. Of course, my opinion is not universal. Um, for some audiences, the content that was cut ended up killing the film, and those who dislike it, their biggest complaints are usually the unconvincing acting and the disjointed scenes. And while I don't agree that those issues make the film unenjoyable for people like me who are already deeply invested in Crybaby's journey and relate to the film's message, I can see where those issues would make the film a hard sell for people who don't already enjoy this sort of thing. I'm obviously biased because Melanie resonates with me as an artist. If I was watching a film with similar issues about something I think is a snooze fest, like, say, a good Christian horse movie, <laughs> uh, under-rehearsed and disjointed scenes would be more than enough to make me walk out. And I admit, the first time I watched it, I did find it a bit confusing in some places, most notably at certain transitions. Some of the songs, like The Principal, drove the plot along in an almost operatic way, if that makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, don't tell me. <laughs> And then other songs, like Drama Club, they fit in naturally with the scene. However, there were others, like High School Sweethearts. Uh, that one seemed to come out of nowhere, with very little to tie it to the plot of the movie. Uh, the transition to High School Sweethearts, it was really jarring and threw me off the first couple of watches. And the transition out of High School Sweethearts, Crybaby reading the love letter, was so subtle I didn't even notice it until my 200th watch. I assume these abrupt transitions are a symptom of the script being cut down. Given the scope of the story, there wasn't a lot of room for romance, and only the bare skeleton of a romantic subplot remains in the film. 
However, I hesitate to judge the film too harshly for this. The High School Sweetheart segment was absolutely beautiful, and even though it wasn't necessary for the narrative, I can't imagine leaving it out to save my sorry soul. High School Sweethearts is arguably the best song on the album, and it would be a shame to leave it out just because it's not necessary or because it's hard to tie in with the final product, you know. The same goes for Strawberry Shortcake, which had basically nothing to do with the cut of the movie we got, yeah. I admit that. But, like, could you imagine skipping it? It was awesome. <laughs> would the narrative be more concise without those segments? Yeah, okay, maybe. I'll give you that. <laughs> However, it doesn't greatly suffer from those segments being included. Not really. Plus, those songs have great messages that do contribute to the overall meaning for the film, and it's hard not to be wowed by the great choreography and costuming. A lot of the fun from this film comes from the visuals and the music, and removing the best parts for the sake of more narrative would not necessarily have made the film better. And while not all the songs contribute directly to the plot, they do all hit these near-universal experiences for Melanie's target audience, so very little context is needed for them, really. If only some of the transitions were just a little bit smoother, I would call this a complete non-issue. Thankfully, if you're nuts like me and you watch one musical over and over and over again, the more obsessively you watch it, the less bothersome the abrupt transitions become because you just kind of get used to it. After, like, the eighth or ninth time or so, I barely even noticed them. How many times have I seen this? Don't ask. <laughs> Don't ask. Granted, most of the critical reviews of the movie are positive. It's just that critical reviews of the movie are few and far between. It just seems like not many critics are taking it seriously as a movie. It's like it's not anywhere on their to-do list. They seem to view it as more of a musician's project or an art piece. Like, rather than a movie, it's 13 music videos tied together into a script. Of course, Melanie described it this way themselves in their Billboard interview. Quote, it's all of the videos together of the next record, all 13, with dialogue and whatnot in between, connecting all of them together. And I'm directing it and writing it and styling it and doing the makeup, Martinez explains. The film is really a huge priority of mine because it's really important to me that people can truly understand the sentiment and the story when they hear the record for the first time. And I really want people to be able to follow along properly. I have such a clear vision in my head, but it's always about the execution. I'm a perfectionist, and even if something comes out great, it's still not perfect, you know. End quote. With that, it seems Melanie had realistic expectations, albeit with an unreachable standard. As a perfectionist myself, I get it. And it must have been crushing for Melanie to be unable to make the exact movie she wanted. On the bright side, though, the majority of the audience, from what I've read online, seems to feel the same way I do. The film may not have crushed the box office or gotten an overwhelmingly warm welcome from critics, but hey, I mean, it has over 100 million views on YouTube. That's nothing to sneeze at. People of all ages are loving and relating to this film on a daily basis. Yeah, the film has its critics, but every work of art has its critics. And, you know, I'd argue it doesn't really matter what the critics say. There seems to be this odd mentality among critics, both professional and amateur, that if a work has flaws, then it's not just enough to simply point out those flaws and move on. You have to tear it apart. Now, firstly, there is no work that doesn't have flaws. Give a hater enough time and they can rip anything apart, even classics like the Godfather and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, some of my favorite movies like Nerdland and Sucker Punch are considered irredeemable trash by critics, with an average score on Rotten Tomatoes at around 20%. And there's often a huge gap between what the critics like and what the fans like, such as with the 2014 movie The Interview, which was lambasted by critics but adored by audiences, especially when it first came out. So you'd think we'd have by now moved past this obsessive need as a society to grade art on a scale of one to five stars or whatever. But no, the flawed work deserves to get the shit roasted out of it. Some critics are so self-important that they have this like evangelical need to keep other people from enjoying films they don't like. I will never understand this. I, mean, I studied psychology, so I know what's going on in their heads. Critics are people who love art, but for some reason failed to make it as an artist, or worse, didn't even try to make it as an artist. So they instead get stuck doing what for a living, commentating on the artwork of other people. So critics tend to be harsh, hurtful, jealous people who spend more time looking for flaws within a work than trying to understand the work that they're supposed to be analyzing, which is why I don't really take critics seriously. In fact, I don't even remember the last time I 
check the reviews before buying a movie or even a book. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying every critique of K through 12 is jealousy fueled nonsense from losers who don't understand Mel's elaborate vision. <laughs> I'm I'm simply saying that just because something has subjective flaws doesn't mean it still can't be widely praised and adored. Frankly, I don't even see the point in ruminating on the film's flaws. They're not as distracting as people make them out to be. Uh, K through 12, it's it's a wonderful movie, and I'm not backing down on that anytime soon. There's a lot to be enjoyed about it, and if you found it confusing on your first watch, I invite you to go ahead and watch it again. I promise it'll make more sense the second time around. Sure, maybe the movie isn't perfect, but one thing I learned in Screenwriting 101 is that some stories are just too big to be told in 30 minutes. Uh, God knows I've embarrassed myself in front of the whole class trying to shove full-length movies into 10 minutes and doing it very badly. But Melanie did everything they could to make the film work. It's still an enormously comforting movie, and I love it the way it is. That said, I would also absolutely love it if Melanie did something with the original script at some point. Like, like even if they just released it raw, like in a book, I would read that. I've noticed a lot of uh, professionally published books getting, like, webtoons, for example, comic books, and it would be nice to see a K-12 comic book. But I would also completely understand if Melanie would rather focus on future projects instead, you know, given how hands-on they are with their work. And if K-12 did come out as a comic, for example, I doubt Melanie would trust another artist to understand their vision. They're very meticulous with their art. And yet I'd sacrifice my left lung to read the original script of K-12. through <laughs> What can I say? I love the movie we got, but I wish we lived in the timeline where Melanie got to make the movie they wanted. Well, thankfully, the issues that plagued the first film did not hinder the success of K-12, through which now has over, again, over 100 million views on YouTube. It has also been confirmed that there will be a second film, which will further expand into Crybaby's universe, and I look forward to seeing what Melanie can accomplish in the future with more experience. Part 4. The Magic That Makes K-12 through So Great A lot of times, people who did not like the film, like maybe they gave it one watch, it wasn't for them, and walked away uh, ruminating on its flaws and whatnot, they get really curious how so many people can enjoy it. They just don't understand it. And the short answer for why so many people are willing to forgive K-12 through for its budget-induced shortcomings is simple. This is a film about solving the world's problems, made by somebody who is paying attention to the world and what's going on in it. Now, that sounds like it shouldn't be such a rare thing, but the majority of Hollywood is completely out of touch with reality. If a big film studio attempted to make a movie like this, I guarantee you it would be hot garbage, no matter the budget. Like, imagine if Harvey Weinstein produced Teacher's Pet. It, it, it would be bad, okay? <laughs> Granted, most movies are hot garbage nowadays, I admit that, and sometimes I feel like we've started accepting mediocrity. But K-12 through came out, and wh what can I say, it has a lot of heart. K-12 through has become my go-to comfort movie when I am upset, especially when I am stressed out as an autistic guy trying to get along in a neurotypical world. I've addressed this in past videos, but I'm extremely impressed by how Melanie has been able to connect with both a young and an adult audience in one work. K-12 is an enormously comforting movie for adults and teens alike, as it uses the issues we all face in middle school and high school as like a metaphor for social and political issues we're facing in the world today. The principle, for example, at face value, it can represent any authority figure who gave us grief in our teen years, but he also represents Donald Trump, a former host of the show Shark Tank. The drama teacher represents rigid gender norms, social expectations, oversensitive and easily offended audience, etc. So it doesn't really matter that we didn't get a lot of time to, say, for example, get to know Miss Harper, or that we didn't have a direct confrontation between the principal and crybaby, unless you count the phone call. You know, the film is so personal and relatable that we're already invested. Watching the school system get dismantled is satisfying without the need of an elaborate setup because we already know what it's like to suffer from an overreaching government. And if we're not old enough yet to understand how overreaching the government is, then we're probably a high school student who relates to how messed up the education system is. And most of us have had this experience at some point in our lives. 
uh, where we aren't able to fit in or where we can't be both ourselves and live up to society's expectations. Especially for neurodivergent people, fitting in can be absolutely agonizing. So it's nice to finally have a movie where you can sit down and watch Crybaby dismantle the sleepaway school and therefore, you know, metaphorically dismantle the systems of oppression that tie us down. Drama Club, especially, is an extremely cathartic song for me. Anytime people are trying to drag me into some stupid drama that I never asked to be a part of, which, incidentally, is, like, all the time. Especially as an autistic person, it's hard to tell how to act appropriately in public and thus how to live by the script. And the world we live in nowadays is so very different from the world I grew up in. The internet both opened up the world for people like me, but also changed it irreversibly and, in some ways, for the worse. Existing in a typical world when you don't have a typical brain is difficult, be it because you're neurodivergent or simply different from others. And this film is like a big hug for sensitive people who aren't usually seen in or represented by film. This is particularly true for a new age spiritualist, particularly those who fall under a specific niche. A Christian, for example, has an entire section in the bookstore devoted to fictional characters who share their religion, at, le at least in America. People like me who believe in things that the mainstream considers crazy aren't used to seeing our stories told at all, let alone having a whole movie that caters to us. Which, for those of you who don't know, I don't go by an organized religion, but, you know, I believe in spirit guides, I believe in empaths, I believe in reincarnation, I believe in aliens, past lives on other planets, and the subjective feeling that you're just too damn sensitive to belong in a shithole like Earth. Immediately after my first watch, I realized that Melanie and I have some similar spiritual beliefs, or at least that Melanie was inspired by beliefs similar to my own, one or the other of those. So the movie made me feel kind of specifically pandered to in a way that no other work of art ever has. The scene after Strawberry Shortcake, where Crybaby is lying out in a field talking about how she doesn't want to feel pain and be on Earth and is begging Lilith to take her away because she can't cope with it anymore, that's just a whole ah! traumatized neurodivergent mood, no matter what your religion is. <laughs> Melanie is good at that, though. They're really good at writing songs about specific feelings while not closing them to that singular interpretation. For example, Show and Tell, that's technically most likely about meeting the demands of their audience and record label. But it's also a big mood for creatives who are trying to coexist with capitalism without spontaneously combusting. You know, you can't just make it as an artist and create whatever you want. You have to find some way to turn your art into money, and not everyone succeeds at that. It's a rough road because if you decide to pursue a normal day job instead, you may not have the time for your creative projects. But if you make your entire living depend on the success of your creative projects, you might also starve to death. As far as my screenwriting dreams go, I traded my Sidfield screenwriting guide for a sandwich, so don't count on me leaving YouTube and going to Hollywood anytime soon. Melanie is also good at tapping into the vulnerable parts of near-universal experiences. An example of a widely cathartic song for a lot of people is Strawberry Shortcake. I wish I had had that one, but I was in high school. It's just such an awkward time in your life, because your body is changing and all of a sudden, boys are looking at you differently. The imagery of the schoolboys with the sharp teeth devouring her cake body in an almost animal-like way is such a clever way of illustrating that feeling. And boys are not expected to control themselves, and instead girls are expected to cover up. Thus, the girls get dress-coded because their shoulders are visible on a hot day, and they're sent home to change because boys quote-unquote can't pay attention with bare shoulders around, and so often it feels like girls are painted as villainesses simply by virtue of being girls. Also, that soft-serve ice cream-shaped hair is just the single best thing I have seen in my entire life. Strawberry shortcake and orange juice both fit into a larger message about accepting your body and the imperfections that come with it. Really, I could make an essay about each and every song, but this video is getting pretty long. I, I did not expect it to be this long. I might go back into more detail about my interpretations and meanings of different songs in individual videos. I'd especially like to talk about Kelly. I always said I was going to make an analysis video about Kelly, but I never did get around to doing that, did I? Anyway, my point with all this is Melanie gets a lot of flack for the script of K-12, through but they're actually a great writer. They're good at creating these multi-layered metaphors that are easily accessible and yet open to interpretation that makes them relatable to a variety of demographics, and you see that sort of thing all throughout Cray through 12. 
Crybaby was a well-written album, yeah, don't get me wrong, but Melanie's lyrics have gotten even better since then. K-12 through is a masterfully written album, and though the film script gets picked apart for its shortcoming, it actually has some wonderful gems in it as well. You know, in the opening, Crybaby recalls her dream. She says, The voice of a thousand angels said to me, It's temporary. And that's such a great way to introduce the film, because on the surface level, high school is temporary. It's a hellish but short period of your life, and that's where the character Crybaby is going. But it also plays into a larger theme that existing in a world where you're different is difficult, but that this whole life is also temporary, that you've lived lives before this one, and that you will live many more, and most importantly, that you have to live your life, even though it's painful, because the only way that we can truly learn is through experience. Sure, the actors may not all have had the best delivery for all the dialogue, but You start in the womb and end in the tomb is both extremely quotable and plays into the themes of the movie incredibly well. It's a cute setup for what is ultimately a story about doing your best with what time you have. The film's message is clear, you know. Death should not be feared, for it is another part of life. And you will have many more lives to learn all of Earth's lessons. However, no matter how painful life gets, you should not yearn for death, as you still have important things to do here on Earth. Your time will eventually come, so make the most of it now before it does. To live is to suffer, to survive is to find meaning in the suffering. The funny thing is, I usually hate stories with a moral lesson. I find them so preachy and annoying, and I can think of several examples in my head right now, but... Anyway, somehow, Melanie manages to pull it off eloquently in K-12 through by approaching the lessons in an empathetic way, rather than in a sanctimonious way. She talks about issues in a way that makes people feel seen, not preached at. She speaks truths that most of us already know, but that we forget from time to time, when the going gets tough because we live in such a harsh world. And a sleepaway school was the perfect setting to tell a story like this, because almost everybody remembers what it's like to be in high school. And even if you had a positive high school experience compared to everybody else, no one escapes completely unscathed. A great moment of the film that shows the harshness of the world through a high school setting is the setup to Drama Club. One of Crybaby's classmates, named Dean, turns around and mocks her for wanting to be a president, saying that women are too soft and sensitive to handle a man's job. Crybaby responds with a rather tongue-in-cheek, Having a larger capacity to feel and express emotions are one of the many qualities that make us superior to your kind, which, you know, offends and stirs the whole class. I talked a little bit about this in my video, Why Are Liberals So Obsessed With Gender? But this phenomenon is called projection. Dean complains about women being too soft and sensitive and thus inferior to men, but when Crybaby matches his energy, saying that it's actually men who are inferior, he cannot handle it. Dean was acting cocky, but really he only felt comfortable sharing his beliefs because they were so accepted in the environment that he was currently in that he did not expect to be challenged, let alone by a soft and sensitive woman. So what's actually going on here is the reason Dean is calling women soft and sensitive is subconsciously to separate himself from women to cover up his own insecurities, which is what leads Crybaby into the song Drama Club, which the opening lines are, Everyone's so soft, everyone's so sensitive. Do I offend you? You're hanging on my sentences. Okay, I'll stop now. So she's not using the words soft and sensitive in the sense of feminine, maternal, or empathetic energy in this case. She's using it to refer to people who can't handle opposition or others having opinions that are diffi- you know, that differ from their own. Not everyone is mature enough to live and let live. This short exchange isn't just a really great, time-effective setup for the song, but it's also very realistic and plays into the larger themes of the movie. The men who are the first to call other people weak and overly sensitive are generally the most insecure out of all of them. The world is not just a painful place for empaths, it's a painful place for everyone. Some people just handle it by lashing out onto others, especially when toxic masculinity comes into play. Aside from that scene, the script has some other great lines that are totally unforgettable, and they have a profound wisdom not usually found from people in their early 20s, let alone from celebrities. 
And I mean, celebrities in their early 20s have an average maturity level of what, 12 and a half? I mean, Demi Lovato tried to cancel a small business because they were triggered by their sugar-free alternatives for people with diabetes. Justin Bieber screamed at his wife because she beat him at an arcade game. And Ezra Miller choked a woman at a bar for joking that she could take them in a fight. And all those celebrities are, like, my age. <laughs> Guys, I'm 31. My bar for celebrities is currently, it's so low, it's not on the floor. It's on the ninth circle of hell. And then meanwhile, there's Melanie encouraging people to be empathetic and find strength in what others perceive as weakness. I'm not saying Mel's perfect or that they're the only celebrity on earth who's in touch with reality. <laughs> But still, Melanie is a breath of fresh air in this industry, somebody who actually does care both about people and their art, and that comes across in K-12. through That's what I'm trying to say. And of course, I can't make this video without talking about the absolute perfection that is the K-12 through aesthetic. Melanie went above and beyond for the aesthetic. They were committed to it. Every frame of this movie is beautiful to look at. It's cohesive, and most importantly, it works with the plot. Retro themes carry the connotation of the time in question. When we see things from the 50s, we don't exactly think about individualism and female empowerment. K-12 has a clear message that society has been stuck in its oppressive ways for too long and needs to change. Thus, a pastel retro vintage aesthetic isn't just cute in this case, it's also congruent with the themes of the plot. These messages wouldn't have landed the same way if the aesthetic was more present day or futuristic. And before you say that no thought went into this and it's just Mel's general aesthetic, there are breaks with the retro vintage theme. In fact, Melanie didn't even design every single costume themselves, so... No, it's not just Melanie's aesthetic. No thoughts, head empty. Melanie knew when to let somebody else do their job, you know. For example, when crybaby spirit guy Lilith appears as an angel, she is appropriately dressed in a regal off-white dress with a gold bodice or something. I don't know, I'm not a costume artist. The costume was designed and created by Christina Flannery. It fits in well enough not to clash with the vintage aesthetic of the film, but this outfit paired with the elf ears and the headpiece gives off a, a more antiquated yet regal vibe. Paired with the special effects, this costume communicates that not only is Lilith not from the same world as the other characters, but that this isn't a being you would want to mess with. Similarly, the bubble latex outfit, signed by Melanie and built by Christina Flannery, separates Crybaby from the world she lives in. As Crybaby meditates, speaking to her spirit guide in a field, she is likely in a visualized safe place. You know, a lot of people, when they meditate, they kind of create this room, so I think that's what's going on in this scene. So from this, we can see in Crybaby's own mind's eye an imagined reprieve from the restrictive sleepaway school where girls must wear pink dresses and boys blue pants. So this illustrates that Crybaby also doesn't really belong in the environment that she's in. And of this retro sleepaway school, how did Melanie manage to convey how old the gender roles in Drama Club are, not only to us, but in a more vaguely retro time period? Well, by dressing the actors in an even older-looking attire, more reminiscent of the late 1800s. Now, it's not historically accurate. I even looked up what irons looked like back then, and let's just say those irons looked heavy. But it's close enough to history to where you can tell what they're getting at without compromising the aesthetic, because, you know, real Victorian fashion was not nearly as cute as we pretend it is in retrospect. A lot of those clothes were actually just f***ing ah! ugly. But, thankfully, Melanie and Christina knew what they were doing. I'm not saying Melanie necessarily made every single design choice throughout their whole career 100% deliberately. As yes, they have been a fan of vintage toys and such from the beginning. Just that Mel deserves more credit for their artistic instincts. They are a lot smarter than people give them credit for. It's possible that they just went with their heart and intuition, maybe, yeah, and everything just fell into place naturally. Sometimes creatives do get lucky and everything just works out the way we want it to, you know, for once. <laughs> but not just anyone can make that happen. Being flexible enough for last minute pivots, you know, accepting happy accidents, taking opportunities as they coincidentally occur, that takes skill and it takes practice. It's not some talent you're just blessed with at birth. Good taste and creativity are both skills that you develop over time. 
Melanie's artistry should not be sold short under any circumstances. They achieved a lot with K-12 and will continue to achieve great things in the future. Part 5. As this chapter closes, a smoother one begins. It has been confirmed that Melanie is releasing another album with yet another movie tied to it. So far, we don't have a release date, but we do have a lot to look forward to. I doubt their second film will be plagued with the same issues as the first, considering this next release will be more like a traditional film, and Melanie's already gone through the learning curve of the first movie. On the Travis Mills show, Melanie revealed that the reason they branched out into filmmaking rather than just making music is that it's a dream of theirs. That's like a dream of mine to be able to like, that's why um, with the last record, getting into script writing was so important for me because I knew that eventually I wanted to like step into filmmaking in a bigger way. But, yeah. um, but for now, I'm kind of just like blending both, you know, the album kind of um, of course. I mean, that's, yeah, that's the album with it. It's fun, yeah. yeah. But it's like, but I, I definitely want to get into making other genres of, of movies. Maybe like horror movies. Like that would be really fun to do a, a fun like scary movie, like a suspenseful thriller or something. Which makes sense. Ever since the Crybaby era, Melanie has been hands-on with the direction and editing of the music videos, all of which told a story. Unlike most music videos, which let's be honest here, make no sense. Melanie has always been a storyteller, and it's only natural they'd want to express these stories through film. However, Atlantic would have never agreed to let Melanie make a movie about Crybaby's story if it wasn't attached to an album. They're a record label, after all. At the very least, they probably wouldn't have paid for, like, a three-hour movie about Crybaby set in a sleepaway school with no album whatsoever attached to it at all. It's less of a risk to them if they give it the budget more akin to, again, 13 music videos stringed together than that of a full feature film. Yes, it's unfortunate that K-12 through is a string of music videos with some plot in between, but it was the only option Melanie was given. So what sticks with me is that instead of giving up and just staying stuck in the music industry's box, Melanie did their best to pave a way for the future they wanted. Even if the solution wasn't ideal, it still got their foot in the door. And while I love Melanie's music, I'm excited to see them express themselves through filmmaking more in the future because I, I love musicals. And if their first ever attempt to branch out into feature film worked so well despite all of the challenges and restrictions they faced, imagine what they could do with, say, $30 million and less restrictive investors. Who knows? If things go well enough, Melanie may reach the point in their career where they no longer have to do what a record label tells them to. They could just make a full musical however they wanted and follow whatever vision they had with far fewer authorities to fuck. <laughs> and that is the future I want to live in. Wow, I, I can feel my voice. <laughs> a huge thanks to all of my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. My whole existence is crowdfunded. I am alive because of you guys. And if you really enjoy my videos, uh, please consider tossing me a dollar or three on Patreon. It really does make a world of difference in my life since I can't work a normal job right now. And please check out my side channels too if that's your thing. And as always, please rate, subscribe, and blessed be motherfuckers. Ah! See y'all.